losing a parent is, is, is bittersweet because you want to keep them. But at the same time, you need to understand that there are some things that they prayed for for you or over you that they cannot access physically mm. that need to be done on the other side mm. you know and even though you are grieving and it's sad i always tell people i'm like my condolences however what i'm going to say to you is watch what how life is going to be so amazing after this mm. because they had to leave so that the big things can happen you know Hello, Agenda Women Tribe, and welcome to another episode of Working Smart and Living Well with Namdeni Mdaki, and that is me. I'm really excited about uh, my next guest, a uh, very good friend of mine. Her name is Tiamo Modisane. <sighs> <laughs> MC, host, stylist, producer, actress. How do you do all of this? Mm. You forgot award winning. <laughs> But it's neither here. Okay, which neither. part is award winning? All, all award winning mm. MC, host, stylist, producer, actress. I couldn't even memorize all of it. I had to literally write it down. Babes, I understand. Okay, so I want to know number mm -hmm. one, how did you end up doing all of this stuff? Because I think it's like all in entertainment, mm -hmm. but not a lot of people kind of dabble into, into you everything. know into everything and you've been quite consistent in so it's not like you do a lot more of this than that yeah you've been quite consistent in kind of exploring all of these roles you just came out of uh, the basadi uh, <laughs> woman in music mm -hmm. giving us the looks as usual oh, honey. number one how do you do all of these jobs and how was that experience of uh, basadi it looked absolutely amazing I think of myself firstly as an entertainer um, and an artist and a creative. So within the creative space, you cannot box creation to one thing, you know? And, and for me, if I wasn't entertaining or if I'm not entertaining, I'm dead. So I, I'm able to, you know, I view, I view styling as a form of entertainment because I get to be creative. I get to, you know, make someone else see themselves in a different way. I get to play with color, play with patterns, play. And for me, it's just like, it's a whole new world that exists using clothes. Mm. Um, when it comes to emceeing, it's about, you know, engaging with people. And that's the hardest thing because when you're on stage, people need to stay focused on you mm. and and i think having people skills and understanding that at the forefront of everything is just fun and 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 you know just genuineness and authentic authenticity mm. i think yeah I, th I don't know if I'll answer the first part of the question. Yeah, um, I think definitely one of the things that you've said to me in the past is that, you know, all of it is about creativity mm -hmm. and that's a huge aspect within the entertainment space mm -hmm. and that's kind of how you want to explore the entertainment space yeah. fully. Out of all of these roles, which one do you enjoy the most? That's the hardest because I can't say I enjoy styling, I, you know, or I enjoy... What, cause I And... and, and, and each of them play a specific thing. For me, growing up, I've always wanted, like I grew up with an aunt that did what you do, you know? So for me, it was like, okay, TV, not far-fetched. Mm. But I was always fascinated with what happens behind the scenes. Mm. You know, I've always wanted to be the producer, the director, you know? Because I think for me, that is where the creation mm, that's actually true. is. That is true. You know? Um, there are so many things that people don't know happen behind looking good. You know, mm. the reason why you, you're here is you have a makeup artist, a hairstylist. So, you know, there's so many people that are involved in bringing the picture together. Mm. And with acting, you know, in high school, I used to direct plays. And I never, I, did, I played, um, acted in a few, but for me, acting was like, um, 
why act when you can direct? Mm. You know, why, why can't I bring it out of someone? And I think where I am now, I'm in a space of being so comfortable within my skin that I'm able to take on someone else someone else's role persona mm. and, and, and make it come to life. Um, before I was just like living, because I, I was already acting in my life. I had to, mm. picking up another one was just too much. Mm. But yeah, so I can't really box them. Yeah, you mentioned your aunt and I know you've spoken about um, a lot of the female influences in your life mm. when it comes to, you know, some of the work that you do and how you show up, right? Who were the most prominent female influences in your life when you were growing up? Oof. And how did they influence who you are today? Oh, now you really want to get the tears mm -mm. starting. It's um, just a question. No, you really want to get the tears starting. Um, so, <laughs> you, you, and you, you know what? <laughs> I'm trying to be professional. Basic, basic question. Literally, and, and you know why I ask? Because I think... To know you is to know them. You have... 100%. Yeah. You, you, you really have uh, embodied a lot of who they are. And I know for me, in just our engagement, how much that comes through in, mm. in a lot of ideologies around how you carry yourself, how you show up in the world, a lot of advice you give me, you know. So I think I could never have a conversation with you without bringing them in because... Mm. You are the embodiment of, of who they, they, they have been. I literally was prepared for this question, but I didn't, I didn't think it would come so soon. <laughs> um, I, you know, my women have played such a huge role in my life in the sense that, you know, I can't even say, like, from my dad's side, my late aunt, who was, you know, um, a TV presenter, she did um, Gospel Gold, she had a show on SBC One, you know, before there was a three talk, there was life for you, you know, and then she later went on to radio and she was a social worker and she worked at Barra and all of these things and she was very much a pan-Africanist, a pan-Africanist, so she had friends who were from Ghana, all, you know, all around Africa. And she loved language and she loved, you know, deeply rooted in, 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 in her belief, you know. And I think I carry so much of her in me. Um, then I have my mom who, you know, I look at... While I was getting ready this morning, again, I was trying to, and like, I anticipated this question. I was like, hmm, you know, how best do I answer this without being teary or being, and I think the best answer I could say was the difference between my mother and my grandmother was my mother, my grandmother was a humble, but not modest woman. You know, my grandmother knew how to be in a room but not dim her light. Mm. You would know she's around and you would, you know, she'd make you aware that she went to a good school. You know, she did matric. She was, you would know, mm. you know. Um, and whereas my mom was modest and humble. Mm. You know, she'd walk in and want to just be in the room and just, you know, but when it's, when one thing about my mom was her laugh was contagious. Her humor was one that I think carried me through, even through her passing. I remember, you know, watching her or looking at her, you know, a body and laughing, laughing at her, wishing she was here to help me laugh at her in this <laughs> situation, you know? So, yeah, I think I, I, I can't really s say this one is more whatever, but the three of them collectively have molded me and I carry them so deeply. Mm. I think when I think about my personal losses, one of the, the biggest challenges um, 
at the beginning, because you, you mentioned that, you know, you've lost your mother and um, your grandmother, and these are people that were quite influential in, in your life. I know for myself, uh, in the early stages of particularly losing my grandmother, one of the, the biggest challenges was navigating big moments, right? Mm. And um, mm. always wishing that she could see the results of her work, Aww. right? And um, I want to know for you, how has that loss impacted the way that you navigate the world today? Whew. Um, it's, it's, it's never easy. Um, and, and, and I think, I'm trying not to look at you because I'm not trying to, you know, uh, um, when, so 2017, my mom passed, right? September. How old were you? I was 28. Um, and I, I think, you know, I had plans. I had these things I wanted to do with my parents, with my mom, you know. And then 2018, in July, my grand passes. And one thing that I haven't, that, I, that, you know, I always tell people, or not really, but when I was in, I think I was in matric or grade 11, I, my mom had had um, meningitis. And you know, when you're old and you have meningitis, it's very deadly. So what happens this morning is I used to work. So this morning I wake up, it's a Saturday, she's doing laundry. I'm waking up, I'm going to do promotions. I go do my promotion. I come back. Mangbuya into empty. My grandmother is disorientated. You know, she's panicking. She's what's happening? Where's everyone? I see the laundry, they are I'm just not. Um your mom is in hospital. What happened? She just collapsed. You know, a lot of things happen. Mm -hmm. you, I just saw this person before I left. Um, and I remember walking into the hospital and they had her in the ICU. And you know when you, when you, like, you walk into a ward, right? And when you walk into a ward, you see beds. Everyone's here, you can see that. The thing is about ICU, everyone in there is definitely Critical. like, you mm -hmm. know. But then there's that one that's isolated that even the nurse is sitting here because at any second, anything can happen. And I'm walking through, I'm looking for her here and she's in an isolation room. Mm. And there's pipes and everything. And I was just like, what is happening? And I remember... You know, going home and, 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 and making a pact with God. And I was like, you know, um, I'm not asking for much. I don't want, uh, I don't want a lot of things. But if you could just save mm, my mom and my grandmother um, to witness me graduating, witness me buying a car, buying a house, the big things that I want to achieve. If you could do that for me, God, you know, you'd have done a lot. And obviously when my mother passed, I was angry because I was like, we didn't do a lot, mm -hmm. you know? But then I realized God was, God delivered and God was faithful. My mom got to drive in my car. My mom got to see me, you know, navigate a career and, and build something sustainable. Um, and so did my granny. So from there, navigating the loss was just like, they've seen me achieve the biggest things and everything else for me is, is a test of them. I always tell people that Losing a parent 
is, is, is bittersweet because you want to keep them. But at the same time, you need to understand that there are some things that they prayed for, for you or over you, that they cannot access physically, mm. that need to be done on the other side, mm. you know. And even though you are grieving and it's sad, I always tell people, I'm like, my condolences. However, what I'm going to say to you is watch what, how life is going to be so amazing after this. Mm. Because they had to leave so that the big things can happen. Mm. You know? When we first met, there's something um, you shared with me around um, <clears throat> whether it was um, if a conversation you had with your mother um, closer to the days of her passing or on the day of her passing um, that was quite impactful for you. Mm. I want you to take me through, you know, the, the, those days, you know, the, the, the final days, right? And I'll tell you why. I think that there is so much that happens in that moment, right? The day you hear about the loss and the series of events that take place um, after the, the day of the loss that sometimes don't allow you to fully engage with your goodbye, mm. right? Mm. So I want you to take me through what that looked like for you, um, whether it was for your mother or your grandmother, because I think at that time you were old enough to be in the room, you know, when decisions are made and yeah. the process starts to unfold. And also how you navigated all of that coming out of, you know, that particular conversation that you had with your mother. Hmm. Okay, so... Um... When is this? I think 20, 2007, 2008, that's when the meningitis happened. She made it out, right? Um, then I went to varsity. First year, second year. Came back, then went again, and then she had a stroke. Now she has a, now she gets a stroke and I'm just like where do we get the stroke from like mm -hmm. you know um and the thing is with my mom she was never a sickly person mm. you know she would she would she was never sickly so when it was sick when she was sick it was mm. the extreme of it um but there was one particular incident where she was recovering from her first stroke and I came to visit and while I'm visiting, I get woken up, you know, and I get told, like, my dad's like, your mom's having a, um, a seizure, a stroke again. And I remember lying in the back seat or sitting in the back seat with my mom's body and her, my mom's head in my lap. And she's breathe, trying to speak and trying to do everything, but there's just so much foam coming out. And I remember watching, looking at her, thinking, seeing the life leave her body. And I remember saying to her, you can't leave. You, you can't do this here now. Um, she made it out. She made it, she recovered to a point where, you know, you could never tell that this was person, someone who suffered two strokes from having her one side, you know, almost paralyzed to full recovery, working, talking, whatever. And as I said, mentioned before that our humor, her humor was, was as dry and as dark as mine. So, you know, would have times where she would talk and this is now leading to the last days of her where I'd be like, yo, Pelona Rishi, like, Buesila. This is to me, see, this is say, this is mellow energy, you know, and she, she'd just be like, <laughs> the thing Hambayazin was on Kumbula. And it was just always that joke, you know. At this particular Sunday, it was Heritage, Heritage Day. I had fallen on a Sunday. And I woke up in the morning and I wanted to go to church, but the Spirit said to me, go home, go see your mom. Drove, went to see my mom, and she's sitting there and she, Something's off because my mom, 
love to cook. But on this particular day, she had made pup and... I think it was pup and meat or something. And it was a Sunday. And I walked in and I was like, what's this? Like, who are you? Mm. You know, and she turns around and she says, it's Heritage Day. This is our heritage. And I'm like, girl, <laughs> so it's like a lot of other things, you know. But then we move and we sit and we have a conversation and we're now gossiping and we're skinnering. And in the gossip, she turns around and says, you know, I'm proud of how of the decisions you've made and how you've lived your life. And because this is totally bizarre, I'm just like, uh, where is this coming from, whatever. And I brush it off. Monday was a public holiday. Tuesday, I call her at work. And then when I call her at work, she speaks to me, but she gives the phone. She's passing the phone to everyone and not really her. But prior to that, she had called me or, you know, asked me, can she call me? And it was random because I was at work and she's like, I need you to make peace with your dad. I need you and your dad to be cool. And I was like, why? And she's like, you know, I'm not going to be here all the time. And I need to know that when I depart, things are fine and you guys are able. And I was like, I remember saying to her, one thing that's going to kill you is the fact that you want to mediate what's ever happening. You and I are cool. Let's be cool. Let, you know, we, all, all of us are carrying our own little things. Mm. Don't fight other people's battles. And I think that's what my mom used to do. She, was, she used to carry everyone and, and forget her own, mm. you know, stuff. So here's the thing, right? Um... My mom passed on Wednesday morning. I found out today it was actually Tuesday. I was called on Wednesday morning. She passed out on Tuesday evening at mm. about 11. Um, I had spoken to her earlier on in the morning, in, in, in that very same day, mm. you know. So to wake up to a call at 3 a.m. that, and the call was so like, you know, my dad said, your mom is late. At 3 a.m., I'm like, late for what? Mm. You know? And, and then he's like, no, y your mom's passed. And from that moment on, I went on to flight mode. I, was, I did not know my left or right. So much so that life only kicked in the Sunday after we had buried her. Because she passed away Tuesday. Wednesday, we started preparing. Saturday, we buried. On Sunday was when everything, you know, kind of hit. Because the things about losses, mm. you get lost in it. Mm. But, you know, there's still a sense of family, mm. you know. And only when everyone else has carries on with their lives is when it hits you like, oh no, this person's no longer here. Mm. And I was like, this is the same person who made sure that there was food in the house, that, you know, the small mm. little things. Mm, are taken so, care of. Yeah, so now it's like, who's going to do this? Mm. You know, and my grandmother's old and she's got dementia. I, I, I cannot tell you, I did not make any decision. Mm. I, I remember saying to my brother, I need you. Anything you say, who's younger than me, by the way, I was like, anything you say is right with me. Mm. Because I could not understand which soapy I was in. Mm. Like, I'm like, there's a lot going on here and I don't, I don't want to be part of it. I don't want to. And I felt like me having to choose the coffin was me confirming. Yeah. You know? Everything you're doing yeah, is just so, confirmation of what's happened. Exactly. Everyone else must decide and I will just spectate. I will show up when I need to show up. I remember coming to find an outfit at, at Santon. And I know Santon like the back of my hand. But I could not find Zara. I was walking around. Like, I was you know, trying to make sense of where I am because I'm not here. I'm mm. not 
existing. Um, and that's, even after, it took me a while to come back and, and make decisions where I need to now make decisions not only for myself, but for my brother. Mm. You know, I need to. I think one of the things that you mentioned that's quite interesting about the space, you know, when you lose someone and you are just this nuclear family, um, and you don't even have time to kind of feel that there's someone who's gone, and then there's this influx of people that come into the home, and then you go back to being a nuclear family, but now you have kind of have one person missing. It's very interesting, and I, I'll tell you for myself, one of the thoughts that is constant in my mind now, especially at the age that I'm in, is that period is on my mind a lot. I've had many losses, but I've, I, I did not experience them as I imagine I will experience the losses that are coming because now I'm going to have to be part of the conversations around what happens. I don't know if I'll have the privilege to say I can't think of anything and I need this one person to, to talk to me. I don't know if I'm even ready, you know, not just only emotionally, but even financially to, to navigate that, that week. As the oldest child, when that happened for you, how, what were your affairs financially? And I want to bring this up because it's something that I want to land with people, right? We've just experienced a lot of loss, which I, I, I imagine would have gotten people in the mindset of, you know, being better prepared. But the thing about the human mind is we forget, yeah. right? Yeah. We go through these things and we, we kind of just wing it. Yeah. And then we're, we're back in the same space that we were in before, you know, the challenging experience. When all of this happened for you and you were in this whirlwind of, you know, decisions that needed to be made, you're the oldest child, what, what did that look like? What was the, the, the financial space looking like at, at the time? I mean, considering <sighs> it might have been something that you're not even ready to, to, to navigate. <sighs> okay, this feels like therapy. I'm going to try and answer this without crying because this was something that gutted me. Mm. It gutted me completely because at the time I wasn't earning much. I wasn't earning much, mm. right? Had it happened three years prior, I had money. I would have mm. just been like, let's go, you know. Um, but I had just moved jobs and used money, you know, to do things. I did have a funeral cover, but it was only for me, mm. you know. And I remember my mom was the one who was like, do you have funeral cover? Do you have, do you have? So I had all of these things, but I had only covered myself. Mm. Because to me, it's far-fetched that I'd live in a world that doesn't have my mother. Yeah. You know? And even if she would pass, I would at least have money. Mm. I remember feeling so useless and just feeling like, hence why I even gave my, you know, duties. As yeah. Bill. I was like, to yeah. my brother. It was I a cannot, lot to deal with. Yeah, I cannot. You know, you seem to be umuntu nemali who ends my decisions. Mm. So I had nothing. Mm. Therefore, I cannot be deciding anything. Um, and I was like, you know, this is the first time I got to see my younger brother as an adult. Mm. Because one thing about losing a parent is you grow up instantly. You, th you might be 40, but if you have your mother, you are not, you and I are not in the same. Mm. It's just like how you can be 35 and not have a child. And there's a 20 year old or an 18 year old who has a child. That person um dala because of the responsibility. Of the responsibility. The weight of the exactly. responsibility. You know? So I saw Dumi show up. And I remember going, wow, you know. But financially, and I had to even after, you know, through the healing and the grieving, I had to make peace and forgive myself mm. for that for wow. not being able to contribute to her passing. 
mm. financially, you know. Um, yeah, it still guts me. Mm. It still guts me because there's things that you want to do but you can't, mm. you know. But, yeah. How do you think the experience would have been different for you should you have been better prepared financially? Because I think we undermine, you know, the value of financial readiness mm. juxtaposed against loss. Mm. What loss feels like when you know that you can have the closure of, I did what I needed to do for this person that mm. I valued so much, mm. versus these emotions that you are speaking about when you are in this experience, you are navigating the fact that you've lost this person, but then also you don't feel like you can honor them in, 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 in the best way that you mm. can in, in, in these final moments. What, how do you think the experience would have been different for you should you have, you know, been better ready, particularly just on the financial side? I, d I don't know. Mm. And the reason I say I don't know was because if you were at the funeral, you would have witnessed the most... I remember sitting there, and I, I, I tend to do this. There's times where I have out-of-body experiences where I need to take myself out of what's going on and look at it from just, you know? And I remember sitting there going, this is beautiful. Mm. You know, I remember her coffin sitting and just white roses all around. Just... I, it, it was so beautiful to witness. And I was just like, I wish you were here mm. to see this, you know? Um, so I don't think financially, my, my, both my mom and my dad were prepared. Mm. Um, what would I have done differently if I had the money I don't know. Or maybe even how, how would it have felt for you? Because I think it's not sometimes so much about the physical things that mm. you can do, but it goes back to those emotions that you just expressed of, you know, wanting to participate, yeah. you know, to some yeah. degree. Yeah. I think as a child, you'd want to just say, you mm. know, but then I, what consoles me is how much, and this is where, you know, people tend to get it wrong. People tend to focus on the funeral. Mm. You want to show up in the last moment, but you never did it before. Before, One thing my mom can never say is, I never did anything for her. Mm. My mom had Chanel foundation. My mom had things that she never knew how much they were. Mm. You know, she'd be like, you know, this thing is finished. And I'm like, honey, you finished... Coco in just like a, a month. Mm. You just, you know what I mean? And that gave me peace to say when she was alive, I did absolutely everything for mm. her. I, I wouldn't mind giving her money, my last cent, because, you know, and she knew it. So that consoles me. Um, and I think, you know, with loss, as much as you want to show, you also have to understand the intention behind it. Because some people want to do it because I genuinely love this person and I want to give it's a gift to them. But other people are focused on puzzle team. Mm. You know, already I was on TV, so people already knew me. It would have been that whole thing of, oh, my baby, oh, my kid. You know, and it's like, that's all we could do. Mm. But I think because leading to it, my mom had, a, we had experienced the best of me, what people said. If anything, people were just like, I mean, I don't remember having Ugula Pele. We never had all those things, you know? So, and we looked amazing. I remember saying to my brother, if there's one thing we're going to do, is look amazing. We're going to look amazing. If we're crying, if we're crying in our sunglasses, that's what we're doing. <laughs> we're looking amazing. Because that's how she would have wanted us. My mom would call me and say, so-and-so has passed on. Oh, shame. And I think, it's your So you understand, like, mm. already she's telling you bad news, but she's like, listen, deliver, you know? 
If you had five minutes. No. <laughs> no. Next question. <laughs> we'll wrap it because we're not answering that question. If you had five minutes with your mom today, mm. what would you want her to know mm. about where you are now? So you really want to? You really want to do done. this? We're done. Wow. We're done. Hmm. Hmm. And I told you, don't like. I'm also not five... gonna look at you, but I just want to know. <sighs> you know, I think um, there's something so powerful about how we navigate. Challenging times, losing loved ones that we don't often give ourselves credit for. You know? Do we really have to answer this question? And I think it's such an important thing to recognize how much strength we carry just as people. Mm -hmm. And I see all the efforts that you make, you know, in crafting your best life. Oh, okay. And I think I've always just felt it's so important to recognize that the people that are not with us now would still be proud of us now, regardless of where we want to get to. And it's also important because it also helps you recognize just how much you've done. <sighs> okay. <sighs> I've had five minutes with my mom. I say thank you. I would say thank you. Um, and thank you for for praying for me while you were alive and continuing on the other side. I would um, I would hold her more. I would attempt let her know that we're okay. You're okay. We're okay. And I think I would also ask her to put herself first more. I think the one thing she didn't do was put herself more and be unapologetic about it. Mm. And I think, you know, I look at things, how, how life materialized after her passing, and I'm like, had she put herself more, so many other things would have been avoided. Mm. But I would, at the top of the list, would, it, would be, thank you. She did. She mothered. She mothered the best way possible, or the only way she knew how to. And she did it. Damn good job. Damn good job. Well, I know that she's proud of you. And I, I know that she knows that you're okay. You're the most okay mm -hmm. you've been. And I think um, she would have longed for that for you more than anything else. I didn't mean to make you cry. No, make you did. You did. But I think it's important to visit these emotions to just recognize... And you're the only one who can bring these emotions out. What we're capable of. And you're capable of a lot. So thank you. Thank you. For sharing this moment with me and for sharing this space with me. Uh, 
Thank you for watching today's episode. Make sure to switch on the notification bell, like, comment, and subscribe. You can also catch the full audio version of this podcast at 5 a.m. on Tuesday on all podcast platforms. Finally, if you want to be featured on our Instagram page or website, comment below with a nugget that was insightful for you in this conversation.